Thank you all for coming to this session. I hope you enjoy this YouTube presentation. Uh, I'm Rob Riley. Uh, with me here is Pete Mantel. And uh, let me go right to introducing the host of the Jim Bregman Invites You To series, which is Sensei uh, Jim Bregman, Olympic bronze medalist, world championships bronze medalist, 10th degree black belt, many times president of the U.S. Judo Association. Without, with that said, uh, Sensei Bregman. Well, we're very privileged to have Travis back with us today. As many of you know, Travis was a three-time Olympian silver medalist and a multi-medalist in the Pan Am and European Championships. And he's going to give us a tour of usajudo.com and the American judo system that he and Jimmy Pedro have been developing and are now requesting people to join. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Travis Stevens. Thanks, Jim. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Lorenzo. Um, yeah, so Jimmy and I um, spent some time through COVID just really thinking about judo as a whole and where we struggle at in America. And we were trying to think about what would be the best resource for club owners, for local dojo owners, for um, bigger players in the marketplace. Um, like Jimmy would be a big player. Jason would be a big player. Like these figureheads in American judo and what would be a great way to get the community together and really expand the knowledge of judo so that people could improve. Um, and we came up with the American judo model or the American judo system as we call it online. And that really is just a way of training judo so that you learn judo. And it's something that helps local black belt. It's something that helps Olympians. It helps me as a person, as a coach, become a better coach as we're making and we're developing this model because what really happens to judo players is you need a whole bunch of people throughout the scope of judo, right? And the scope of judo goes from the first time you tie your belt until your Teddy Reiners, your Onos, your Abe's, you know, your Clarices of the world that are winning world and Olympic medals on a consistent basis. There's a wide range of judo. And if you segment judo into basic, intermediate and advanced, where it's just people live in these categories and you want to throw world and Olympic and international level players all into the advanced section and then you want to throw all of your national and up and coming athletes into your intermediate. And then you have all of your base level judo players is how we've determined and broken out the American judo system on usajudo.com. And the reason why we've, we've done that is we really want people and the judo players and the judokas that really buy into learning judo to obsessively train and drill inside their area of expertise and really know it like the ins and outs you know i for example the other day i was filming an instructional for the american judo system on ashiwaza and it took me six and a half minutes just to explain the technical aspects of how to do proper foot sweeps that's without a partner because and it's hard for people to really conceptualize but when you've done judo for years, you forget that your body has been trained to do certain actions without even thinking about it. And the struggle becomes when you're trying to relay and convey that information, it's actually lost to you. So when you take a very high level judoka and then you have him teach very basic level things, they can't do it. 
right? All the times I go to camps and everybody wants to understand how I do my Ponce and Agi, but they forget that when I'm drilling and when I'm practicing, I'm actually building the foundations that you see in our system as a white belt because I'm strengthening my body and my um, rhythm so that it gets stronger so that the more advanced stuff applies. You know, if any of you guys have ever been on YouTube or Instagram and you watch the Japanese teams through like clips that the IJF puts out warming up in the background, they do very basic, simple things. No, like you don't see the throws during the warmups and the practices for Uchikomi that you see in the competition because those types of throws and those types of actions are geared for very specific um, situations that they have a knowledge base that they can pull from, but their day in and day out training actually relies on the foundations. If you've ever been to Tokai, Jim can attest to this. When you go to Japan and you warm up, the entire team spreads out and they're doing Uchikomis and it's Ochis, it's Uchimadas, it's Murote Sayanagis. It's very basic movement that I know bores all of the black belts. It bores all of the brown belts. It even bores a lot of the blue belts because they're like, I've done this already. I need something new. But the problem is, is when you really break down those core movements, you know, it's kind of like, how do you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? It's not just, you know, you slap some peanut butter on one side, you slap some jelly on the other and you put it together. There's all these little nuances that go into it from how you unscrew the jar to how much you put on the knife, to how you spread it, to how you hold the bread. Like, do you spread it with the tip of the blade or the other part of the blade? All those little bits of information that you've done throughout your judo journey as you get better, get forgotten about. And what we've done with the American judo system is me and Jimmy have actually stepped back and said, wait a minute, what if your white belts and you went to it with the understanding of the number of actions that it took for you to accomplish the goal was simplified where the goal and we taught people how to win through goal setting, right? What is the goal? The goal is to put my hand on the sleeve and the hand on the collar and win the grip that in and of itself, as Jim will tell you is super difficult, even though it sounds super simple. And so you have to develop just your foot pattern, your positioning, your hand positioning, your body positioning, all those things have to be right before we've even discussed throwing. So when we built out the American judo system, we did it where everybody across the board, black belt, whatever, it starts in the foundation. We fix it, no partner, no nothing. Let's get your body moving correctly because that's the easiest thing for you as a person to understand. You know, we've developed um, a system of putting tape and stuff on floors because we feel that the visual cue for you as the learner and also you as the practitioner allows you to see what is right and what is wrong. You know, when I was coaching a lot of the 13 and 15 year old athletes here at the club, and we have some talented kids that are really starting to develop, I, I have a TV on my wall in my gym. And we play music through it. We use it as a timer. And I was arguing with one of the 13 year olds and he goes, I didn't do that. And I said, 100%, you did that. And that's wrong. And he goes, I would never do that. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll film you just keep doing it. And we watched him do his throws and his Uchi Komis. And then I paused it. I put it up onto the television. I played it in slow motion. I said, see right there. And he goes, Oh, because there are so many little actions that you don't realize you do just subconsciously that have to be fixed and addressed. And it's super boring for the coaches at the club level to pause practice and then say, Hey, wait a minute, John Smith over here isn't opening up his elbow when he does say an and he's got to keep his hand off his shoulder, right? We don't want to be down here. When we do Morote say Anagi. we want to be up and have the weight and learn to strengthen the shoulder so that we can roll through on the technique. But as the sensei running the club, you can't just pause the entire session to fix one or two kids. And the American judo system and why we've decided to put it online is so that there's that resource for everybody, right? It's not a replacement for the judo you do at your dojo. It's something that you can check yourself with. You can 
watch when you're at home. You can think about the judo you did at that Randori session. Like, where was I struggling with? It's no different than when you go to school now and you have a textbook of information so that when you go back, you can study for class the next day and you can excel when you get there, right? Not everybody can attend judo seven days a week, twice a day, like they do overseas. You know, when you're in France, when you're in Japan, when you're in Korea, you do judo in the school system and then you do judo at night. You're doing judo twice a day and you're doing weightlifting. Well, you can't do that in America. But now that we have this system where you can actually check yourself by using these markers on the floor, then you can actually go home and you can get those extra reps in and practice and teach your body where it needs to be to be successful. Once we've done that, then we move on to partners, then we move on to uchikomis, then we move on to walking. We've built this pattern of systematically improving where we develop techniques based on the complication of it. So if you wanted to do Iponse and Agi, for example, you could post your hand on the collar and you could fit in. That's one technique. We jump into the intermediate side where you do a Kochi to move the front leg to get them back into a square stance. And then you do your Iponse and Agi. Now we go into the advanced section because what we're going to do is we're going to add a third step. Now you're going to break the grip, move your partner into an off balance position so that right when he recovers, then you can do the Ipon Sanagi, right? Every one of those things is a dedicated action that you have to achieve before you can do the Ipon Sanagi, right? First, we start in a square stance, nice and easy in front of your partner. Ipon Sanagi is easy. I get it. I can come in. But when your partner puts the right foot forward and angles, you can't do Iponse and Agi anymore. So now we add a step to either move the foot or we move the partner. We never combine the two actions until the advanced step because you're adding difficulty. There's more things that they have to process to understand. And I think the easiest way for black belts to understand the difficulty of learning judo is to go take judo from somebody who speaks a different language or go learn how to wrestle. Because when you're saying Ippon Senagi, Hikite, Sukite, Sugiyashi, Ayumiyashi, right? Ashiguruma, like these are all confusing terms, right? That like they're, they're trying to remember what Hikite means, but you're already two sentences past that talking about the feet or all of a sudden like, the coach is talking about how to roll this up so that they can see the watch on their Uchimata. And then all of a sudden you've 180 it. And now you're talking about the back step being on the balls of your foot. And the guy's trying to remember the hand. And then you've brought his attention down here, but then you've brought it up to the hips. And there's just such a dynamic range that you've really got to break it down and focus. And so this system is really designed to help people move through those steps quicker by breaking down every individual step so that you understand that step and you understand its importance. So that's really where this whole thing came to be as just this supplemental thing so that people can get through judo quicker and improve. Let me share this screen here. If you guys, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So I changed up the homepage today. This is kind of just the homepage that has the offers um, of how people can become a member. These are all of the instructionals that we currently have on the site. So Jimmy's done an entire um, instructional on just Ochigari, just all the different setups and combinations that go along with it. We've done Tayatoshi, Koshi Garuma. Um, gripping, which we're actually redoing now because we're missing a lot of the core fundamental basics. So we've gone back to just body positioning, holding the gi, different ways to hold the gi to reshoot it. Uh, Osorogari, um, wrist control, which is a Newaza series that I've used and Jimmy's used and Kayla has used. Um, Marty knows it, Colton knows it, Angie knows it. It's just, it's a good core thing that teaches you how to link your Newaza together over and over and over again so that you learn and you train your mind and your body on how each technique in Newaza, there's seven, 
and how they go together and transition amongst each other. Same thing with Juji Katami. There's different grip breaks, different positions, different turns, and solutions for different problems that you may or may not run into. Um, with every membership, we offer um, bi-weekly live classes with either Jimmy or myself. So we hop on a call just like this one. Um, we stream ours through YouTube through a private link given just to the members. And we usually have a theme for the class. So last week's class was with Jimmy and he went over the importance of using a cross grip and how to establish a cross grip, when to use it, throws to do off of it. Um, and then at the end of the class, all the users can ask questions, get clarifications on the cross grip, but also any other topic that they are struggling with with their judo. Some people ask questions about specific scenarios and matchups, right? Like when Abe and Moriyama fought, there were a lot of questions surrounding what about this? Why was he doing this? This had a lot of gripping. Why is that? And they get to ask those questions because we get that feedback from a higher perspective as to why they're really doing the things they're doing. And I think that match um, threw a lot of people off because it was so grip intensive. And I think they expected two Japanese guys to go out there and grab the gi and just throw each other. But judo has evolved a lot since then, especially in Japan. Um, and we have an Ochi or an Ogoshi DVD. The reason why we've started out with these ones is they're the ones where white belts should be comfortable with in that beginning stages of judo. They're not wild. They're not crazy. They're very controlled. Um, but they also are some of the most common throws seen at the highest level, right? A lot of the other throws that you a little bit more advanced that you don't really see that often um, going back into the 2012, 2016. Um, now it's becoming more popular, but throws are like Sode, right? With the gripping rule, Sode has become a more popular throw, but other ones would be Ashiguruma, Oguruma, um, Tani Atoshi, Uranagi. Those are a lot of throws that are usually only seen at the more intermediate and advanced level stages. So we decided to pick these, th these throws and these turns just because they'd be good foundational building blocks for people. And then I went to my strength and conditioning coach at Boyles, um, who's a world renowned strength and conditioning coach. Um, he's coached NHL teams, um, World Series teams, the Bruins, a lot of the pitchers, professionals, Columbine, NFL players, they all go through boils. I went through boils throughout my career. And we basically said, hey, I need a strength and conditioning program that judo players can follow, not bodybuilders, not baseball players, not hockey players, judo players. You guys have trained me, right? I've gotten stronger. I've gotten healthy. Like, what are these core just, you got to be able to lift. You've got to like know what to do. And so we filmed an entire just strength and conditioning block on this is how you do a hang clean. This is how you bench. This is how you do your rows. This is how you do this. This is how you do this. Here's the foam rolling you need to do for recovery. Here's some of the stretching you need to do for recovery. Um, just to give people that access so that when they go to Planet Fitness or LA Fitness or their local gym where they can't afford a personal trainer, they are at least they have a starting point where they know what to do. And then once they get comfortable and they're building on it and they have that experience where they're confident in what they're doing, now they can go get a personal trainer. Because the last thing you want to do is go get a personal trainer just to teach you kind of what you already know, right? It's like hiring a nutritionist before you even started trying to eat healthy, like try to eat healthy do that for a little bit, get healthy, and then go see a nutritionist on how you can make it better for you specifically. So it just gives you a good baseline to start. And then that a professional when you're ready can build up for it. Um, we also have in here a whole dojo operations kit um, because we understand that judo, the number one question people ask me is, why is jujitsu so popular and judo's not? And it's because people don't know how to market themselves and they don't understand the value that they have to the community, right? So what we've done is we've ran through an entire dojo operations manual 
um, that people can sign up for. They can buy it monthly, they can buy it yearly, they can buy it every six months. And it basically gives you access to myself, to Jimmy, and also a professional team here that manages our dojos day in and day out. They know how to set up all the email campaigns, SMS campaigns. They know how to do all the intro lessons, create the offers, create the gear packages, how to build your curriculum, how to build your schedule. They will help you and guide you through all of those processes. Um, and we decided to start where people could buy a complete dojo consulting practice, right? Where we'll meet with you. I think it's weekly or bi-weekly for one hour to just help you build your business so that you can quit your nine to five and you can do judo professionally and you can afford your mortgage and you can afford a kid's college fund and hopefully be making six figures a year just teaching judo full-time to recreational people and changing people's lives because that's what we're all trying to do we're just trying to empower people and change people's lives because judo can do that it's done it for me and it's done it for countless others and we decided to start with um, contact management and internal and external events as their own separate mini courses, because these are the two things that can move the needle for your business today. Um, internal and external events, I think could change if your dojo brings in, let's say $5,000 a month, we could probably raise that 30 or 40% just with this internal events package right? We'll teach you how to monetize and get the community around you to embrace you and pay more to be more inclusive in your club. It includes everything from birthday parties, uh, date nights, parents nights out, movies nights, event nights. Um, we even have an entire script on here on how to run Fortnite events with Nerf guns, right? For your kids. We have all the marketing tools on how you build flyers for your gym, how you send the campaigns, when to ask, how often to ask, when to notify parents, when to close off the signups, how people pay. All of that has been built into these systems. Um, in the members only area we have for internal and external events, it's an hour and a half of just introductory content that people can watch so that we'll teach you how to run Facebook events and set up your pages, how to do applications through apps and services that you may not be aware that you had access to. Um, dojo signage, Facebook groups, timelines, how to run buddy weeks, in-house tournaments, parent nights out, family days, um, non-judo seminars in your school. There's entire um, just videos here to give you information to get started along with an entire resources of uh, Google Sheets and Docs just that you'll own and have that you can download directly onto your computer and you can start with today. And all of this includes um, consulting where you can get on a phone, run through the videos, run through the courses and discuss how to apply these tactics to your dojo, right? Because every dojo is a little bit different, but you can't just rubber stamp it. So what we do is we take the knowledge and the information that you provide to us with our expertise, and then we mold the program to fit your desires and your student and your clientele. Um, you can see in here for contact management, oh, I have it hidden from myself. Nice, I have to fix that. So in the Tachiwaza section, these are all the videos that the members currently have access to. Um, these are all the different Tachiwaza techniques and encyclopedias that you can pick from. Um, if we go into my Ippon Senagi DVD, the, in the introductory just foundation course is one hour long of just content. Um, right now it goes over, over everything from directional pattern to training with bands to um, Uchi Komi's Nagi Komi. And it even has just at the end of it, like, hey, I know you've gone through all these videos and you've practiced, but here are the common mistakes that you need to go back through and then make sure you're not making as a judo player because my 20 years of experience running camps and teaching tells me you're probably making these same mistakes because nobody is there actually watching you, right? And I can see some of the coaches and they're going, yep, I know exactly what those are, right? But 
as a new person, those are just natural habits that are ingrained into us that if somebody's not there paying attention, like pointing out, they're not going to know to fix. So we have those videos built in. We also have an entire um, intermediate section. And in the intermediate section, what we did was we decided there were two types of videos that needed to be shot for every scenario, right? There's the, how do I practice this scenario to improve it and train it into my system? And then when and where do we apply it? During the intermediate stage, the number one problem people tend to have is they, they understand that they have a tool and they have a bunch of tools, right? There are all these different tools from different combinations and different techniques. But what they don't know how to do is how to apply them in the right scenario, right? A lot of times the techniques that we see on the international stage, they work because they use the right tool for the right job. The person was leaning in the right way. The person's feet were at a specific angle that allowed them to get across on Tayatoshi. You know, all those different things come into play. So what we've done is we've said, hey, if you want to work on uh, Neo Sotogari left on right, we say, here's how you drill it. This is how you're going to drill it into your system. This is how everybody drills it. But when you're trying to apply it, here's the scenario that you're looking for as a judo player in order to actually get the technique to work for you. So we've actually broken down all the intermediate sections into two categories. One, which you see here is the square stance where the partner is just allowing you to do it and they're taking the stance needed for you to practice. And then we've gone into the application where it's a little bit more of a randori session live. And this section for Ipon Sanagi is 41 minutes long. And then we have an advanced section of Ipon Sanagi, which includes variations like my split hip Sanagi, how I do it with my right leg, how I do it with my left leg, how I do it walking forward, walking backwards. What do I do and why do I put my leg to the outside sometimes? Right. And how do we do all these setups and variations? How do you do it against a righty versus a lefty? All these different things require different answers. And you just need to know all the different steps and be able to practice. And then once you've understood that and you know how to apply it, you'll know how to pick the right techniques and you're going to start seeing your ability to throw skyrocket through the roof. And that's the big takeaway is just knowing that you know the technique doesn't mean you're ever going to be able to do it unless you understand what you're looking for and what you need to actually get the technique to work. Because you have to be able to put your partner in the right position or see your partner going to the right position so that you can time it correctly. And so just the opponent saying, Agi, I think there's 26 videos in the advanced course. That's an hour and 10 minutes long. We have 17 videos in the intermediate. That's 40 minutes long and another 22 videos just in the foundation. And this is just one technique. It is all the Pon Sanagi from drop to split hip to regulars to Uchi Komis to Nagi Komis to moving. That's it that you're going to see here. Um, the one that Jimmy wishes he didn't do and I did is Ochigari because it's used in so many diff, just wildly different applications from um, how do we use Ochigari to set up big throws? And then also how do we use big throws and then Ochigari, right? Because a lot of times when you're doing big throws like Uchimata and you miss it, you don't want to just come out because you'll get swept. You actually want to come out and hit Ochigari to throw your partner or at least get out safely. And all these different things have to be addressed. So the foundation course, because Ochigari is just such a dynamic throw with so many different uses and variations. It's actually over an hour long, right? It's 83 minutes of 30 videos. You know, the intermediate section is a little bit shorter because the intermediate goal is throwing with the main technique, which is Ochigari. So the advanced side is how do we use Ochigari um, to score with? Here, so like you can see Tayo to Ochi, where we're actually setting it up. Here, it's what happens when we miss that particular throw and then go into it. So we have different concepts and applications for all these, and it just follows that same structure for all videos all the way through. 
because what we want to try to avoid is that green belt trying to do five different actions to get one throw. What we really want to do is we want to keep them in their wheelhouse in the intermediate section and let them master it. Really let them put two hands on the E, control the grips, and then throw with the technique that they're trying to throw with, right? We try to avoid the, here's what I'm trying to do, but my partner did this. Then we did X, then they did this. So then we did X. We want to avoid that never ending loop of if this, then that, right? At some point when you've made two or three adjustments, you need to go back and actually fix adjustment number one because it wasn't good enough to catch them, right? So if your kid is coming up to you and he's saying, hey, so every time I try to do this throw, they just keep stepping around. Most of the time for me, when I'm looking at an intermediate level judo player or a guy who's first starting out, I don't give them the counter to the counter, right? I actually go back and say, you're not doing the technique correctly. Even though their partner may be doing the thing right, I need them to focus on technique number one and doing it properly. And that's, and that's really what this system has done. We don't address the nuances of the technique in a full on like high level grand slam or fighting for a medal matchup until the advanced section. That's when you're getting into fainting, moving, how would I move my partner, break a grip and be in position to throw him all at the same time. All that takes place in the advanced section. So this is pretty much how we've decided to build this out. Um, there's obviously a lot more to come because I think everybody that runs a dojo professionally will tell you, you have to be on a curriculum in order to get your kids to understand what is next. What am I trying to do and how do I achieve the next goal so that I feel accomplished and I'm moving through it. The problem with that is it's very difficult to teach all of judo to everybody because there's the martial arts side of it where you have to learn the ashigurumas, the ogurumas, the deyashis, the ashibarais, the subamagaishis, all these different things that may not necessarily apply to the vast majority of international high level, I'm training for the Olympics and I wanna win a gold medal. Some players are gonna learn the ins and outs of it, but most clubs tend to focus on like the things they're good at. USAjudo.com is eventually gonna have the encyclopedia where we're gonna teach you how to learn all of the nuances, right? That way your home club coach, if he doesn't teach you how to do Ashiguruma, you're going to have a resource and you can get a buddy and you can learn the ins and outs of these throws. And during Randora, you can start applying it to your judo. And then you can actually go up to the black belts at your club and say, Hey, I'm trying to do this throw. How do I actually fix it? Cause I feel like I'm 80% of the way there. I need the extra hands on to get to the last 20%. Right. The other thing that we're going to start doing through this, once we start getting more and more of the encyclopedias out is we're actually going to build all these out into a promotion system, right? Where the actual guidelines for your yellow belts, your orange belts, your green belts, your blue belts, your purple belts, all the way up into your brown belt can all be accomplished online through usajudo.com, right? All these videos that we have right now are stored in a database where they're all linked individually to different areas. So we'll be able to pull out all these videos and say, this is the promotion test for your yellow belt, right? What we recommend is you do X in order to develop the technique enough so that you can send me a video of you actually practicing it. And I wanna see a video of you doing 20 Uchi Komis. I wanna see you doing 20 Nagi Komis and develop this test where they can film themselves, submit it, and then we can actually grade them through video on just their ability to test and have a knowledge base of judo, right? Because what we're trying to do is get people involved in the sport on a vast majority, right? There's not enough dojos in America to grow judo in America. They're too spread out. I get emails all the time from people that are like, oh, hey, I live in Oklahoma and the closest club to me is two hours away and I can only drive there once a night. How do I train at home or do things on my own so that I can get better? That's what this system is for. And we wanna be able to go through this promotion system online 
where we can test people based on the visual cues, right? Because up until black belt, it, for me, it doesn't really matter. We compete rank to rank anyway. So if you're a green belt fighting a brown belt and you're both 25, 28, 38 years old, you're going to compete in the novice division, right? That's okay for judo as a whole. So what we're trying to do is get people just actively participating and improving their technique. That's it. That's the sole focus is the improvement of technique and understanding of the mechanics of judo and how things work together. And then when we're ready and able to go into the black belt level, that's when it's actually, hey, you got to come in person. We've got to be doing randori sessions. We've got to see you train, understand that you know how to apply all these techniques because that's what the black belt means in judo. It means you have the ability to freely practice and have the knowledge to train judo by yourself. And we're trying to get people to that point in a systematic way so that they have a better understanding of the whole of judo instead of just the little tidbits. Does that make sense? Yes, I think it certainly does make sense. Um, do we have any questions from our participants? Sure, Lorenzo. Um, that's a, I, I like this, this system. I think it's a great idea because obviously I'm here in Charleston where prior to the arrival of Lisa Capriati, Rob Guthrow and myself, and then Brad Bolin chronologically, not skill level wise, um, <laughs> there, there was a, a sort of a dearth of, of judo. There was Dr. Charles and Eli Fletcher, Al Jacobs separately. Um, and so this is a great way to, to spread judo and, and be able to get sort of this technical knowledge spread out. And I, and I really appreciate it. And there's a lot of work in it already and a lot to go. Yeah. The um, one portion that we haven't really built out that we, we've gone back and forth on, right. We're, we try to, we, un, we go into this with the understanding of not, it's not for everybody. Some people are going to look at this presentation and they're going to poop all over it. And I'm a hundred percent okay with that because I went into it understanding that it's incomplete. Right. But judo can't wait for complete. Right. Cause we wanted to build out an entire coaching course. Like how do you get certified as a coach and what's that foundational level of coaching on how do you work as somebody that's done judo for 30 years? How do you work with the white belts for step one and how do you get them to where you need to quickly so that they can join an intermediate class where it's a little bit more free flowing. And then right. how do we get them from intermediate into advanced where they can develop their own style and flavor of judo. Okay. Right. And so that entire section is still also being built out on how do we work with coaches and get them certified into teaching judo in a systematic way so that as a country, our orange belts and yellow belts are going through this system, understanding the same basic knowledge. Because when we pass them off to the Olympic coaches and the national team and all those people, they need to all kind of have a base level of knowledge that's the same so that we're speaking the same language. That's, that's one of my soapboxes. Yeah. <laughs> and we've, we've been struggling with how do we, where's that starting point? for the coaches because there's such a differentiation of coaches. So it may be just level one is just this, and this is how you get it. But then COVID it's like, how do you test them? When do they come in? Do they come in? Do they do it all through zoom? Like we're still trying to figure out that, that process. One of the things I find with, with the coaching uh, classes that I've taken, so I've certified JA, JF and, USA judo now is none of them actually teach you how to teach. And that's what I want to do because class structure and the flow of the class and how you teach judo is the number one thing that's a going to make you successful mm -hmm. and B keep your students. Yes. So it's not about rank. It's not about testing. It's about 
hey, when you teach, this is how you keep a flow. These are your key points. And these are the things you want your students walking away with on class one, because we're going to reiterate it on class two, reiterate it on class three. And by class six, you should be able to just sit back and say, hey, I want 20 uchimaru uchikomis. Ready? Go. And then your students just break out and do it because you've done it in a systematic way where they understand it. And you understood that you're not trying to get there on day one because that's going to drive you mad. It's going to make you crazy. It's going to make you upset and it's not going to be fun. So you got to find, find it in a very fun, engaging way that systematically gets them to that end goal so that you can stand back and then watch what you've done. Like a painting, watch your kids break out in a line of two bow with each other and just start counting off in unison because they understand. Yes. It's just coaching a coach on how to do that is a, is a little challenging when you don't have the coach in the room to be like, Hey, here's how I do this. Right. You, we've got to actually take a step back and say, when was the last time I was working with a group of kids that I not used to hearing my voice and then what problems arise when that happens so that I can give my response to you that you can use to your students because it's the same interaction. Right. When you've coached at a club for a long time, everybody kind of develops it just like you develop the technique. You forget how you overcome that. Right. So a lot of times I use my jujitsu students as that test because they're new and they're new to me. The judo students, not necessarily because I don't deal with them when they're toddlers. I deal with them when they hit the cadet age and then they start the competition journey. That's my role in judo. But my jujitsu students actually allow me to build and practice those tools to be able to pass it on. Hmm. Okay. We have a question uh, Dr. Riley would like to know. At your facility, do you have a dorm situation where athletes can come and train full time under your leadership? Yeah, yes and no. Um, there's a house where they can rent a room out and um, they can stay. Uh, Jimmy has run one for years, ever since I first started the international scene, he's had it. Um, athletes come and go out of it. Uh, I think there's three or four right now. I think there's another three or four that wanna come in the summer. Um, to move full time. Um, it, it's just at that point, and, and the reason why we've kind of started usajudo.com is because by the time they've come here, right, when that kid's 19 and just trying to figure out how to be successful, people have already won the worlds. So like if you've come here and you're 19 years old and you're like, hey, I'm ready to go to the games, you better be ready to do judo full time twice a day until you're 30. Like I didn't I didn't make that up. That's not my I didn't just like tell you you can't succeed early. Everybody can succeed early. I just want all of you to have that understanding that like you want to go to the Olympics and you want to win a world medal, it's going to take eight years of dedicated hard work with no setbacks. That's just, that's just the way it is because of where we are at technically as a country, right? It's just, it's a challenging uphill battle and it's not for everybody, right? If you think you're going to come here and you're going to do judo twice a day for an hour and a half, and you're going to kind of weightlift on your free time, and you're going to make it to the Olympics. It's not, it's not going to happen. There's way too much that goes into it. You've got to get with strength and conditioning coaches, nutritionists, or psychologists. Um, you've got to do judo twice a day. You've got to run on your free time. You have to study film. You have to be a student of the game and you have to truly, truly enjoy being a student of the game and learning and practicing and improving, right? Because everybody trains hard. Not everybody learns and thinks and processes the information. If all you do is train hard, you're not going anywhere. I'm telling you right now, like, it's just, you got to be able to think on your feet. You got to be able to process. You got to be able to feel and learn and be willing to get thrown. I think of the number one thing that you know, people really struggle with conceptually understanding is 
if you want to throw somebody, anybody, you have to be in a position where you can be thrown. And I think getting over that fear is what really holds people back because they want to be a hundred percent winning all of the time, right? Like they're afraid to pull the trigger unless they know a hundred percent that they're not going to get thrown. And it's just, it doesn't exist. So you have to have that back and forth and that playful mentality where we're going to train hard. We're going to beat each other up, but we're going to go like throw for throw and we're going to try, right? We're not just going to shut down and get rigid and just walk away. We're like, I almost threw you and you didn't almost throw me. So I won. Ha ha ha. Like we go nowhere fast. And it's very difficult for, for people who come here to, to learn that back and forth and learn that mentality. It's just cause it's not in, it's not trained into us from a young age. So there's an entire learning curve where people, it takes us two or three years to get athletes to kind of unlearn their mentality and then relearn that mentality to actually improve. Right. A good, a good example is we do a one minute drill where one person stays out and they do five or six rounds of one minute round randories, right? And they get a fresh body every minute on the minute for five rounds. But what happens is the people on the edge actually go out to meet the person with the wrong mindset because the person who's going out there for the minute is trying to win the one minute round. Their job is to train the athlete who is out there working out. You're supposed to push them, grip them, rip them, pull them, kick their feet out, try to throw them. If they get countered, get back up, get back in your face. Because if he threw you twice, get him so tired that the next guy who comes in throws him three times, right? It's the group against the one and he is fending everything off. Just like when you're in a bracket at a tournament, it's you versus the bracket sometimes, We've all been in tournaments where, you know what? You see the guy who fought the last round and he fought a war. He was out there for 10 minutes. He was brawling. He's all banged up. You threw the guy in 30 seconds and you walked out there confident like, hey, I'm going to win this match, right? So there's always that momentum building and people struggle to drill and collectively get better as a unit. And it's just, it's something that's got to be trained into the community. I guess. And that's, and that's a hard thing to train because nobody wants to lose, but you're not losing. You're improving. You went out there, you tried to throw, you tried to do this. The mindset of how you fight a one minute match is different than you fight a five minute match. It's different than when you're fighting in golden score. It's different. There's different styles of judo that you have to learn. So it's challenging. It is challenging indeed. It's, a, it's one of the most complicated sports to learn because it's so dynamic, so dynamic. Even in comparison to sports like wrestling, right? Once you include the jacket and all the angles that can be created and the leverage points that can be created, it's different. Yeah, having wrestled, uh, I can agree with you 100%. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you very much, Travis. This has been very informative and I wish you and Jimmy the best of luck with your program. And hopefully on a nationwide basis, we can get into rural America, big cities and everything in between and increase the knowledge base and the participation base in the United States so that we can be somewhat more competitive, not only at the international level, but regionally and locally. And if people aren't interested in competitive judo, they certainly are welcome in all these judo dojos for physical fitness and education. So I, I think, think you brought a good perspective to all of this. I think Ben Ashkren, um, the now MMA fighter, said it about USA wrestling, I think a year or two ago. And he's like, there's a reason why Russia wins at wrestling. And it's because they're not the big, strong, jacked, like American wrestlers. It's because they actually work on getting better at wrestling. 
right? Like they're not in the gym. They're not just trying to be strong or they're not trying to out condition you. They're not trying to physically beat you. They're actively getting better at the sport of wrestling. And that's, and that's really what I think usajudo.com boils down to is this is for the person that just wants to get better as a judoka, right? They just want to learn and they want to improve people that want to win more medals will find benefit because there are a lot of nuances in here with the gripping and the tactics and the strategy and knowing when to pull the trigger and when not for a lot of the throws so they can still benefit, but it's really there for people who just, they really truly want to improve, not just, you know, throw somebody at their um, local club or at their local competition one or two more times. Cause you're going into the mindset of the website incorrectly and you're just not going to get the benefit out of it. Right. If you're a coach looking for, you know, if I really need to learn how to do Ogoshi and what's a better way to instruct my kids and how do I follow that system, grab a membership, check it out, go coach your kids, start them right now on a zoom call, right? Because the first section to all these throws is shadow drills and just get them used to moving their bodies and fact check them and get them used to those patterns and those things so that when they come back into people contact, you can start step two with the Uchikomis and the moving, but that would have already had the footwork, the hand placement and the body positioning down so that you can build on it really quick. Thank you, sir. Very good advice. Stay safe. Give my regards to everybody and hopefully we'll see you again. Yep. Thank you for having me. Take care. Travis, could you, uh, Give us a specific place to go to, to sign up for, and to become involved in this, www.usajudo.com. That's it. All you got to do is click on that membership tab in the upper left um, and select the type of membership you want. We do uh, monthly memberships right now for $29.99 a month, or you can buy a yearly membership. I think right now they are $249. Um, and it basically gives you two months free. For the year and we also sell a platinum membership that's 450 and the platinum membership comes with the two months free but it also gives you a week of training here at pedro judo center if you ever want to come out here for seven days to follow along on classes watch the kids classes train with the elite level people um coach alongside myself and jimmy as we're working with the kids to really be a fly on the wall and see how we run schools how we train how we teach how we coach on a daily basis